look for the spark. Look mm. for the person that when you get in the room with them, you come out with a better idea than you had before. If you don't have that, it's the wrong partner at the end of the day. Because if you make a pragmatic decision, you may, it may look good on paper, but it's a marriage. Paul and I have been running our business for 22 years. Hello, and welcome to Design Adjacent, the podcast that talks about the nexus of design, both today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Vinny F. Johnson, and today our guests are none other than Katherine Clark and Paul McDowell, the founders and the entrepreneurial minds behind Clark McDowell. A bit about Clark McDowell for those who aren't familiar. In 2001, Katherine and Paul joined forces to create the original agency concept built around the idea that true collaborative thinking and different perspectives can solve brand challenges holistically and for the better. Together with a talented team of brand architects, they've partnered with some of the world's leading and most forward-looking brands. Their strategic and creative guidance has helped brands better our world by tackling important topics such as sustainability, health, wellness, and even empowerment head on. Our two founders here, a little bit about Catherine. She sets the vision for the business. And Paul says he's the creative force behind the business. We'll talk a bit about that with them today. Catherine grew up in Paris as a child of parents who worked in the United Nations, and she was brought up in a truly global community, steeped with colorful stories, beliefs, and values that ultimately fueled her passion for entrepreneurship and the potential she sees in people and businesses to make the world better. Paul grew up in Liverpool in the UK a hotbed of creativity with many musicians, writers, and artists. His surroundings most definitely shaped his perspective and created a deep-seated curiosity to create, make, explore, and build potential in things. His guidance inspires new ideas and unlocks the ways of thinking. So today, I'm really pleased to invite Catherine and Paul into our podcast. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So it's interesting today, as we go into 2022, there's been a lot of conversation about the future and more particular to our discussion, the future of work. What does that mean to you today when you think about your own companies and practices and the work you're doing? I think the first thing that uh, the changes that happened in the world did for us is we had to really rethink how we design with a capital D, as Paul would say, work around people as opposed to fitting people around the work. For a very long time, a lot of businesses were functioning in a, in a relatively conventional fashion and work was defined by going to work, working certain hours, fitting in certain roles, having full-time jobs. And we found that everything had to be reinvented because the pressures that people were under were just completely different to what we'd seen before. So for example, we gave up our physical space, but we know we need to be physically together to create ideas. So we have a combination of people working remotely, people working in New York City, and then we alternate a little bit between working offline and then sometimes coming together as we did yesterday to spark ideas in person. The other thing that's happened is people are constantly on Zoom all day long. Right. And we realized that we needed to make space for them to have time away from clients, time away from meetings so that they could really get some fulfillment and deep thinking. So we created Deep Thinking Fridays. So really for us, and Paul, please, please jump in and add other things. It was really about designing around people more mm -hmm. than ever before. Yeah, I think because you know, obviously we're connected to a lot of other agency owners as well. We all sort of helping each other and we're troubleshooting, which was great. It was good comes out of bad in lots of ways. Right. Of those it was. So we made some great pals and we we're sharing war stories of lots of different agencies. And um, I think one of the big things that we figured out was there's a danger trying to replicate or analog what, what you had before. You're trying to right. do it remotely. And I think the conversations that Cass and I got to were around, well, if we were to start anew, we were like, this is an opportunity. Yes. You know, do or die time. Like, is this an opportunity to actually think about things? pressure like Catherine was saying well what do we what we do with the space and what does that mean for the team so we don't have to be tethered by the, ge the geographical location so it means we can hire people on the west coast right. in the midwest but which helps not only for the talent pool 
It also helps our diversity of thought as well. So we're not just in this sort of little New York microcosm, this bubble. So there were things around that. And it, as Catherine said, is we have an opportunity of, of, of not just trying to force the way of an agency is supposed to run, but start again and think around each individual, what their needs mm. are, because everyone's individual needs have shifted and changed pretty dramatically. Right. right. Here we are right now. We spent, what, 15 minutes just trying to like hook up with the technology. It's just the reality, right? We have new right. realities. Right. We spoke a little bit about the um, Zoom and, and burnout and all the, some mental health, those sorts of things. We have to think around that, getting time and space to think properly as we're back to back to back to back to back. So We've done a lot of thinking ourselves and also with our leadership team on how do we just basically start fresh and new and rebuild and recraft how we do what we do. So it's an opportunity as well. So there was a lot of fear behind that, probably more for right. me than Catherine, I'll admit, but there's a lot okay. of fear behind that. But there was a point where it's like, well, we kind of have, it's forced our hand, so we have right. to do it. Right. So we've got you working through your fear. I, you know, one of the things that's interesting as you talk through it, was a keen sense of your self-awareness as an agency, of what you need to do and what you need to change. I wonder if we think about the, the mechanisms and dynamisms of change that are happening, you're changing as an agency. Were you seeing the similar type of change transpiring with your clients and with your employees as well, right? It, each of these functions so, are a little different, right? I would say on the client side, we saw a mixed bag. And I would say that the, the clients that had, and I think you, you mentioned it yourself, a real awareness of who they are as a, at the core right. made them resilient, made them able to adapt because mm -hmm. faced with something new, if you know who you are and you have that kind of rudder, if you like, you're able to pivot without feeling like you're losing your soul. I think for clients that were already in a state where they were sort of asking themselves questions around what they stand for, what their values are, what their purpose is, that became a lot more difficult. One of the things that we ended up doing a lot of is helping our clients also understand the world around them. Those clients that were maybe less connected to the forces that Gen Z is bringing mm -hmm. to culture struggled more because the, they may be young, they may not be your consumer yet, but they're shaping the way that we are thinking dealing with issues. So we spend a lot of time also just helping our clients understand the wave of change that is coming. And it's exciting change and we have to embrace it and be relevant. Yeah. And I think on a maybe more prosaic but pragmatic perspective is there is because of technology and Zooms and it's our time and our impression of time has shifted and changed quite right. dramatically. And so there's a different expectation now. So it's like, bang, we can be on, we're all, we're all on to like, there will be 15 people on one call where there used to just be two people in an office at one time. So there's more points of view, there's more conversation, there's more spinning, there's more chatter exponentially that creates more work. There's also a, a more of an expectation getting things done faster. And there's more, right. people are trying to pack more things within the day as well, because we can go back to back to back to back to back. So just the shift in perception of time and efficiency has changed as well. And within that, there's obviously cost dynamics and, and all those sorts of things. So what that does, it's meant that we've compressed, it goes back to the time space, a question that we, we were chatting about earlier, which is there's more pressure to get things done in a smaller space of time. Now, right. good thing is, yeah, we need to be more decisive. We've had lots of conversation around that. We also still need time. The creative process is not a one and done thing. The strategic process is not a one and done thing. It takes time. It's a right. discipline. There is rigor involved. It takes discovery. It takes, you know, serendipity. It takes conversation. And without that, it does hamper the overall creative process to a certain degree. So we've seen a shift in that. So that's where we're trying to really reprioritize, like, how do we find space so we can actually do what we do to the level and quality that Clark McDowell expects? It's interesting as you, you try to manage the shifts. Do you have any insight as to what things are really temporary or what things may be a new next or a new normal as you shift through? What's 2022 and beyond and what's just kind of second year of pandemic? So we're hoping, <laughs> this is like everybody else, that the restrictions and uncertainty are temporary. I'm not sure that they really are. Right. But I think the things that aren't going to change is the desire for people to be more fulfilled with their work. That's definitely mm -hmm. something we've seen and it is going to continue and augment the use of technology, the ability to, the need to be agile. So 
We've innovated more in terms of how we hire, who we hire in the last 18 months than we had in 22 years. So we have oh, wow. people mm-hmm. working all different kinds of schedules on different terms because actually we're having to design around them essentially. And we find amazing talent who may not want to be full-time employees, or we may find amazing talent who want to be full-time employees, but live somewhere else or maybe adjust their hours. So we're constantly trying to uh, to shift and change. So I think that's here to stay, that requirement for businesses to be agile and constantly creating new ways of doing things, which I think for a small entity like ours is very doable and probably quite challenging if you've got an agency of, say, 200 people that becomes a little bit harder. I think you're right. But we're hearing a lot of stories that designers and creatives and our top employees are starting to kind of come into their own agency to realize what's possible, to raise their hands and ask to say, you know, maybe New York Metro is not an opportunity. Maybe LA Metro is not an opportunity. I believe that I can still work and be productive from South Carolina. Yeah. Or, yeah. or Memphis. Yeah. Right? yeah. We're, yeah. we're hearing yeah. a lot more of that where I think maybe five years ago, at least, you would never raise your hand to say this was something that I need, the space and time and distance. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, you know, I think it's given people, not just within the agency, but in, in life, people right. pause and a, sort of a self-reflection, re-evaluation on what's really important to them, on what does fulfillment look like and what does success look like itself. And, you know, as agency owners, our job is to recognize that, is to listen. But the first thing we need to do is really listen. And like, what are people saying? Where are they hurting? Right. What do they need? And then what can we do to help support them so they do feel as though they can be fulfilled, so they can actually live the life that they want to have? And recognize that, you know what, work life, what we used to call work-life balance, they are such right. integrated things these days. They just are. And so it's just it's coming to terms with the realities. Like Catherine said, just working with the, the guys and, and helping design around their needs in a way that works for the whole company, works for the right. organization itself as well. There's also... Kind of a, an interesting thing, and maybe this is a, maybe maybe more of a New York centric point of view. Especially, I grew up in the uh, design industry in New York over the past you know a thousand years, over longer being here, uh-huh. and um, there was always that sort of the the swag and bravado of being in New York and New York agency, and there was you know you sort of slightly looked down upon those that lived in in other places, and that's not as good, and it's just BS, and you don't right. you know that whole thing is gone as well. And the infrastructure and the technology allows for that. So it's a bit of a level playing field in a way. So you see there's other great little agencies dotted all over the place because they don't need to travel as much. And they've had a great education and blah, 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 blah. They also bring in a different diverse thought as well. So we're not – right. the agency world that doesn't have to be as derivative as it's been, and I think it has been for quite a while. So there's, a, there's an interesting – diversity of thought and freshness of, of thinking and input as well, which I think it was happening before COVID, but it's, I think that's sort of sh- shaking things up a bit because it's proven that the infrastructure doesn't have to be the way that it was, that you can actually do things differently now as well. So it's it's allowed more opportunity, I think, for more people. It's great for we got more competition, but, it, but it ultimately it's great for the industry and, and great for uh, you know the, the world of creativity and brands and all the stuff that we get involved in. So, Paul, you said something that caught my attention for our conversation. You talked about working with clients and listening to what needs are there. So I'm going to use this, our podcast, as an opportunity to be the ears in the room to listen. What are you hearing from brands today that they need going forward? What are the brands that you're engaging with? What are they looking for? What are the pain points that they see as we think about true contemporary brands moving forward? There's definitely, and we talked a little bit about Gen Z earlier, there's definitely this craving to understand what do we do with Gen Z? And I'm not talking Mm -hmm. about brands, you know, like Nike that are used to working on, you know, uh, connecting with youth, but it could be a brand that makes baby formula. It could be a brand that makes cars, you know, that aren't targeted at that age group, but that age group is coming up fast and they are asking a lot more of brands and our clients are not, you know, not embedded necessarily in that culture. So I think a lot of it is figuring out how are they going to relate to those people? And then also 
how do they start to embody some of those values okay. if they weren't born that way? So some brands just don't have the, the values embedded that matter to Gen Z today, whether it's around, um, you know, sustainability or right. diversity and all of those things. And so there's this sense of like, oh, that's not us. How do we connect and not become disingenuous? And that's where a lot of it is about understanding how a brand flexes and can age and needs to evolve while staying true to itself. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, it's kind of the existential question for brands. How do we connect? Well, so what's our purpose? What's our role? And then we sort of see what, and this is something I think every brand and organization, as well as agencies, and it's something that we talk about at CM a lot, it's like, what's our responsibility? Right? Mm. It's, and responsibility is a really, for us, is a really important word. And, uh, you know, we're living in a very finite time with regards to environment, et cetera. There's a lot of upheaval and the social upheaval, blah, blah, blah. So uh, for, for an organization that makes things and, and they, they have a role to play in helping design around, around solving these problems. And as agencies, we have a role to play challenging and helping and inspiring our clients as well. So I think listening, if we were to listen to our clients, like they're saying, okay, great. We still need to keep on selling, making money and having all those sorts of things are right, part of the machine. But also I think the smart ones are saying, what can we do? What can we be doing better? And how can we actually have a better impact? And ultimately what is our responsibility? And so for us as, as an agency, our interest is really working with our client partners that are asking those questions and are open to, and more importantly, open to the answers and acting on them as well. So whether it's impacting the community, whether it's impacting the environment, actually doing better, they're the people that we want to partner with because they're the progressive forward thinking companies that actually can have an impact on the planet, right. actually going to have an impact on people. And back to Catherine's point about Gen Z is these are the guys that are influencing. These are the influencers and they're sh trying to shape and form the world that they want to live in so we have to kind of have to understand them and know where they're going and then generation alpha will be on that as well and then that's our role and that's how they will stay relevant and that's how they will actually help positively impact the planet as much as we can because the clock is ticking it's ticking right. fast what do you think the biggest challenge is in kind of reinventing a brand icon for the new generation i you know i think back from like our vantage point in looking back to the brands that matter to our parents and grandparents' generations, right? The brands that we grew up and then looking forward and knowing that it's a space of creative destruction. There's no other better way to describe it. When you think about the companies and brands that were the top of any listing of the top companies 50 years ago, only a small fraction of them exist today. You know, if you think about it, not only of those companies gone away, but new have replaced them. And if we follow that same trajectory, you can expect that in the future. But for those brands that have been able to last, that are icons, what advice do you have for them in terms of this reinvention? Paul, we just went through this with actually with JBL speakers, because okay. uh, yes. that's a brand that's been part of the music culture. It's been part of you know, years. shaping <laughs> musicians right. and and there they are facing this moment so paul you were just doing some training with them yesterday i'll let you take this yeah yeah so so again it goes back to sort of really understanding who the target is who what makes them tick really what their values are in a really important fundamental way and understanding what your role is as a brand as an organization to help to help them live their best selves and to help them do the things that they want to do. So for a brand like JBL, it's about sound, it's about music. Mm -hmm. The Gen Zs, it's about, it's, it's about being real, about sort of joy and optimism and understanding realities of life and bringing mm -hmm. people together and welcoming people, right? And the music can do that. So there's a beautiful, beautiful synergy between how Gen Zs interact with those, very different from millennial, very different. Right. And then more importantly, how do we manifest as a brand? So from our brand expression as well. So a brand is only as good as its actions and its words and being true to them. So how do we define the actions that are, are really important for these guys? And, and how do we live them in a way that is true and honest, authentic, because they will call BS on you immediately if you don't? How does your visual language connect? And then what verbally, what things do we say? How do we say? How do we show up? 
and then being really being super rigorous with every person that touches your brand, your agency, mm -hmm. your your internal team, whatever, fully grasping and understanding the value, the character that the brand has, understanding the personality, the role, and then being true to how it expresses itself. So we just we've just been doing hours of training with the global teams on making sure that the brand manifests itself and everybody sort of understands the nuances as well. Again, right. we can write all the prettiest words on a piece of paper and a page and fancy animated PDF and great sessions, but it, they have to manifest into tangible things. And that's that connected part across the entire ecosystem is really what brand owners need to take very seriously and look at in a critical way and manage it and police it and understand it and keep feedbacking on it. And that's how they'll stay relevant. That's what these brands, I think, that have stood the test of time have done. They've managed to, they don't look back they don't look at the now, they look forward. And you have to right. keep looking ahead all the time and don't stop. It's like there's a class, I think, when's the best time to innovate? Now. <laughs> now. And, and keep looking and keep looking and keep looking because the, things are changing. And the speed of change is so dramatic and so fast. I think it's catching a lot of um, some of the, uh, the brands that you said have sadly fallen to sort of the demise, catching them up. And so brand transformation is one of the most critical things. It's why we focused a lot of our work on brand transformation and really helping mm -hmm. those beautiful the gems these brands can be gems and they can be reinvented and they can be rethought and they can be reborn and made relevant again and so that's probably uh, what we'd say to brand to these brands you know the rubber hits yeah. the road now Catherine, i'd like to ask you this question as well one of the things in paul's conversation moves us in this notion that the future is coming it's not a surprise so how do you make yourself, your team, your clients, your company future ready and brand ready? I think a lot of it, and Paul mentioned the word fear earlier, a lot of it is begins with just acceptance. So we don't innovate, we don't change because we don't want to accept what is in front of us. So if you can create a culture within your organization, like Paul was saying, that listens Okay, we listen and then we accept what we hear <laughs> mm -hmm. and we don't deny it. That puts you in this great position to say, okay, how do we innovate on this? A lot of the things that hold our clients back is this sort of not wanting to face up to something that's right in front of them. So, and you can usually resist for a while, but then the cracks obviously right. get bigger. So the, the, the first thing, and we try and do this a lot with our team is whenever there's an issue, it could be a small one or a big one. It's just not dwelling on the drama of what we just discovered and just accepting it and then saying, right, where do we go from here? And if you start to create that as a constant muscle, if you like, right. uh, a reflex, then it isn't so daunting. I mean, for me personally, when the pandemic hit, obviously very unfortunate for so many people. And so I don't want to minimize its impact. It's been really hard. Um, but on a personal level, it was quite liberating because suddenly we couldn't really quote unquote fail. It's like, okay, well, if we don't do well, <laughs> we have a, this huge excuse. So suddenly it was like, oh, look, this has happened. We're all at home. And we, if you accepted it quickly and thought, okay, there's no real downside here. It enabled us to innovate very quickly. We changed all our systems within the first few months. We engaged people in other parts of the country in ways we never did before. We changed the way we worked with our clients. And so I think... Creating a culture where there, there is this sense of that change is part of your day-to-day -day as opposed right. to something that suddenly happens out of nowhere. Yeah, That is not a big event, but it's your incremental reality, yeah. right? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we're working with brands that we're transforming, we've obviously done many over the years and hopefully continue to do that, is sometimes there's a knee-jerk reaction or they, they think they have to throw away baby with a bath of water or completely change. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. obviously it's like, Hang on to absolutely everything as well. And as Catherine said, there's a lot of anxiety when you're really having to transform a brand because, you know, it's an existential crisis at the end of the day. And so our job, we think, is to help or sort of behooves a, a brand owner to really help who they are, kind of really understand themselves and, train, you know, and, and know what is special about themselves because there is magic in most brands somewhere, right? There's right. something in there. There's a reason why it lasted this long. So it's sort of really getting to understand what um, is special about their DNA and um, articulating that with absolute clarity and then re-articulating where it needs to go, whether it's values, whether it's purpose, whether it's actions, 
brand character, all of those sorts of things that meet the relevant needs of the new sort of target, that whether it's Gen Zs or whomever it may be, Gen Alphas, et cetera. That's where we sort of, where we actually help them pivot and go to the space that they go. Also understanding some of the dynamics mm-hmm. in an organization as well, this, literally the psychology of how teams feel when they're facing right. this sort of like, oh my God, I've got to get future ready. What the hell do I do? You know, there's a lot of holding on to holding on to things. There's um, a lot of fear involved. There's uh, there's gnashing of teeth. There's pulling of hair. So and so helping educate them through the process itself, right. like helping appease some of that fear, and then proving why some of the decisions that they make or helping make the decisions are the right decisions. So we don't subjugate possibility. We don't subjugate creativity. We don't subjugate the way it could and should go. And sort of helping manage that there is a very human part of managing our clients through this whole, you know, can be a fairly daunting journey as well. Right, Catherine? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you, you think about it. When we all approach this work, no one wants to be the team that messed up the brand. Yeah. Right. And the bigger the brand gets, the longer, the most steeped in legacy and history, you know, as human actors and wanting to do the best we can do in the role, right? We come in and you don't want to mess up the color, the palette. You don't want to mess up the story, but it's in that space. I think, as you said, you get some liberation to, to be able to walk people through like, yes, it's going to be messy. It's going to be loud. It's going to be noisy, but this is a part of the process of getting us to where we need to be as a brand. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's sort of, as Catherine said, it's confronting what's in front of you, (laughs) right? Being okay with it. Right. But it's, you know, at the same time, as an agency, our job is to also recognize what's in front of us, which is a bunch of folks that are absolutely petrified you know, right. and nervous. And then and the chemistry, we, people talk about chemistry, it's not just about, you know, we like your work, we don't like your work. It's about trust. It's about being able to have open conversation, about transparency and being able to hold hands together. So we make it a point of really bringing reaching wide in the stakeholders, so making sure we have champions at all levels. Right. Because you cannot push change up a hill. Everybody has to pull change up, everybody, right from the top. So it's really important that we make those connections and, and understand where the fear is, because then we can help and we can really get through the through the anxieties. And that's how we've managed to reinvent touting our own trouble here, but sort of managed to reinvent some some, you know, big brands, some global big, brands. Big brands from yeah. like failure to literally they were about to be delisted and taken out of stores to success and growth you know <laughs> literally which is something we're, we're, we're super proud of and kudos to the team that allowed us to take them on that journey too you as yeah. well i think on that note patience has been a big one and i think mm-hmm. we've okay. made a big distinction mm-hmm. for our team between if you're creating a new brand you've got a team that's all excited they want to go fast they won't have any process they're full of optimism If you're transforming a brand, you have to just go into that process with patience because we may get it quick, but most likely we may just need to pause here. We may need to do extra work here. We may need to go and speak to that person over there. And if you go into into it with that mindset and that expectation, it makes it a lot easier because then you can start to not, I think that sometimes agencies can get frustrated and think, oh, you know, they changed their mind. They don't want to do it. If you go into it knowing, like Paul was saying, what kind of emotions are at stake and just being patient, it really helps because because then we can truly hear what's happening instead of getting frustrated. And as you mentioned, you know, brands, we get the myth of the uh, the overnight success in a brand space. But for the most part, the brands we recognize are built of layers and layers of experience and touch points, good, bad, and ugly, all kind of morphing together. Mm-hmm. I think of some of the brands that, that we engage with that, ha- that you've had awkward experiences with, and that's a part of the brand. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of continues yeah. in there, and yeah. it's a part of it, and you, you, you love it. You love yeah. it anyway, right? Well, that, that's exactly – I mean, that's what a brand is. A brand is not a thing. You don't pick up a brand. or You can't. Pass me that brand. You know, you can't right, do that. Right. A brand's a relationship. It's a set of experiences. That it's a manifestation of the interactions that you have with all parts of whatever a company is, the service, the product, the interaction, the advertising, the communication, whatever, the phone call where it's something's not working, get the, uh, the pink yeah, the other person on the other line. That's part of the brand. 
right? All of those things say- manifest, right? So go on. <laughs> we did a lot of soul searching on our brand, and this dates back a couple of years when we still had okay. space. But there was definitely something about Clark McDowell where – you know, you were in East Village, which wasn't the most, you know, it's not business district. So you're like, oh, this is strange. We're on this little block between Avenue A and First Avenue and the building looks strange. And you came <laughs> in and it was like, oh my God, it must be in the wrong place. <laughs> and then you come in and it just felt amazing. And it was warm right. and you felt comfortable. People were nice. And then there were just some quirky things that would happen. You know, we're pretty, we're very organized, but there was always something, you know, just a little unexpected and very human. But that was very much part of our brand because right. our personality as an organization is not to uh, be the most polished, impressive, let me just convince you. It's very much about, I'm going to listen, I'm going to give you great ideas, but we're going to do this together. And so we were careful not to change that and to mm-hmm. keep a few of those quirks. And it starts from the minute you interview someone, putting them in a situation that they didn't expect. Oh, I'm going to interview in a cafe or I'm going to suddenly flip the people that you're going to meet that day. And that was just part of some of the experience. Now, we've evolved a little bit, particularly with things being remote. You know, some of the things needed to change. But I think, as you were saying it's not about perfection. It's about reflecting the character that you have and creating that experience that's going to connect with people. Yeah. I mean, perfection is not interesting. Idiosyncrasy is what makes something interesting. That gives character, right? And it's celebrating right. the character and amplifying amplifying the things that are special and changing the things that are, are friction. <laughs> right? So, <Yes. laughs> so and we've, we've had a bit of friction, but we've, we've dealt right. with those and they've, we've gone. But part of it is, you know, the, the, the quirkiness, the decrease, whatever word, whatever word you want, is there, the, the things that make something special, whether it's a, an agency or a brand or whatever it might be, you know, it's, and it, but it goes back and to Gen values Z. and intent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real Gen Z ago. actually compared to millennials is, you know, when things are too perfect, they turn off. It feels plastic. It feels manufactured. Right. It feels fake. Entire, so yeah. that's another thing for brands to learn as they're trying to deal with this new generation is being more authentic and human and being okay with some of those little things that maybe aren't as polished as you would like, because that's right. what makes them real. Yeah. 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 That's inter- yeah. I mean, it's funny. See, like the amount of brand books that say we are authentic, you know, it's like, it's like well, well, no, you don't have right. to. It's like, say, it's like say you're cool. As soon as you say you're cool, you are not cool, my friend. You're, that is the definition of it. And, you know, and what's funny is that's probably the definition our grandparents had, our parents, we have, our kids have. As soon as you make the pronouncement that you are cool, you <laughs> cease to be. Yes. In any space. That, that, that's how it is. And I'm living that now. I remember having that conversation with my parents my kids are having that conversation with me now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. It'll, it'll, wonderful it'll, thing. We, we, it'll we come get full really circle, personal, my friend. Get personal with the brand. It's full circle, <laughs> full circle of, of the brand. And, and what's hip and what's on point, you know, it's always an interesting space. You know, I always think about brands, not just the visual image, but also the words and our thoughts that go along with the brand. How words help to shape our, our point of view with brands. Talk a bit about why that's important to have a language and a tone and a vocabulary with your brand. So partly because, you know, the most functional level, the way brands communicate has evolved. So we're using words a lot more than we used to. And the other thing is that words are very much linked to philosophy, values, ideas. And so the tone of voice is the way that you express ideas is a real reflection of your deeper character. You can put visuals on things, but the things you say, right. have a, they have a, a meaning and they create, they have consequences, right? They, there are things that people are going to repeat and be able to take with them. It's going to shape the way they think. So ultimately, as brands realized they needed to have deeper relationships with people, the, the words mattered more and more. So as an agency, and I think a lot of agencies in our space, we've had to really expand our definition of design to being both mm-hmm. visual and verbal. And everything we do in the visual world, whether it's, you know, you do a mood board, oh, well, we need to do a word palette. There are things that need to happen right. with words that yeah. happen with visuals so that our clients can start to learn how to use those things. There used to be this feeling of, I just need to get a writer to fix this. But we actually need all the client teams, everybody who's working on the brand to understand the brand vocabulary because it may be a 24-year-old who's actually 
manning the Instagram and the Twitter and all of those things. So we don't always have the luxury of a writer. So the words need to become embedded in the culture ultimately. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think language verbal has often been overlooked. So it has been overlooked. There's a few industries that actually have used it really well. And it, ironically, I think the ones that come from a, a background uh, or an industry where there's less physical presence, if you like, in retail. So if you look at the airline industry, great example. Right. If you look at JetBlue versus Southwest versus Delta, you can spot, or Virgin rather, you can spot, ex you know exactly what brand you're talking to. If you're looking at a napkin or if you're looking at a ticket, they have defined and refined their tone of voice really well because they've had to because of their ecosystem. And given the shift, as Catherine was saying, in a brand's ecosystem now and how a brand communicates, yes, we're reading less, if you like, from a depth standpoint, but we're reading more across Right. And so being able to kind of really capture the essence of your character, your personality, and say what you need to say in just a few words, there's a refracted eloquence in that. And if you can do it, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful and very important part of your equities and your palate. And it's often overlooked, but we're really doubling down. Well, the JBL work that we just spoke about is exactly that. Catherine? Yeah, and it's similar. You know, you're seeing design get more and more refracted. You know, you right. see those brand logos getting more and more kind of pared down. It's the same with words. It's like, how do we really just capture something in as few words as possible? And the skill that it takes to do that, right? The the polish yeah. it needs to kind yeah. of work through there, and and the commitment, right? Because we all yeah. know with time, it's easy to get it done in 10 words because you have enough time. It's harder to do it in four. Exactly. And it takes an eternity to get to that one. Exactly. Was right. it, yeah. What's the famous Mark Twain quote? He goes, uh, you, 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 wanted it, you wanted the short version, you need to give me more time. Yes. And so it's, yeah, it's exactly. And it is a real discipline and, it's, and it is hard to do, but important to do. So you do have to invest that time. And I think brands that understand that really are, going to communicate more successfully. Right. And I'll say that the time invested isn't just time invested in getting to those perfect words. It's also the journey that you go on. You ask right. yourself a lot of soul searching questions, probably even more so with words than with visuals. I mean, both are equally important, obviously, but with words, suddenly it's, there's just very deep conversations about what's right. being intended and all of those things. So we try and help our clients see that it's it's not just the investment isn't just in the execution; it's also in in the training and the depth yeah. that they have yeah. of understanding yeah. themselves. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm going to pick up on what we were just talking about, kind of the words and the space and the meaning. And one of the other areas that we see growth in is in quote unquote purpose driven brands. And talking mm -hmm. about that self reflection, it just as we talk about in this conversation, naturally flows into that. So with a little nod to Simon Sinek, you know, it's the notion that for a brand, your why is just not enough, right? We've had a generation of finding your why and in our personal spaces, and I say that's kind of a North Star, that's what we're doing. But for a brand, just articulating your why is not enough. How are you able to challenge and help brands really understand how their purpose really needs to be embedded in the work that they do? So I would say two things. One, knowing a why is not enough, meaning we have to actually turn that into actions. So mm -hmm. ultimately under the why we'll have things like, what are your values? What do you actually believe in? And then once you have those values, how do those manifest in terms of tangible actions that you would do beyond selling your product? We could always go to, oh, this is how I would innovate on my product to make more money. But what are the actual things that you're going to do? And then the other thing I would say is when we say the why is not enough in defining a brand, we've really worked a lot on defining brand character as well, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of talk about brand personality or spirit and personality, which always actually somewhat superficial, you know, four words, right. put on a page that kind of go in the design brief. But character encompasses things like where you come from, how you were born, who was there when you grew up, what are the things that motivate you and drive you? Mm -hmm. So we did actually quite a lot of work looking at writers and how they develop characters and then even forensic investigators and how they try and define a character. Right. And we applied some of those techniques to trying to define brand character. Because once you understand your character and who you are, right. that can help you decide what actions you're going to take because it becomes visceral and integral to the organization. So, so we do, we get to a why, but then we spend a lot of time on values, actions, and character. 
really interesting to think about it. I want to conclude with your own words. So we were looking at innovation and entrepreneurship. And on your site, there's an article, and, and I'd like to quote you all in saying this. We often think about entrepreneurs as visionaries, yet we overlook some of their biggest assets. And it's their adept ability to problem solve and recover in real time. I think those are incredible words as we think about our kind of era now in terms of stewarding brands and businesses that the visionary part is important, but it's our problem solving and navigating challenges and our ability to come back again and again. That's important. It's resilience. We mm -hmm. actually did a lot of work with the Oklahoma City Thunder NBA team. Okay. And it was very interesting because when you work with a sports team, they win, they lose, you know, they're in the press every day. And then you also get to understand the athletes a little bit and what they go through. And so there's something there about what we were talking about earlier, really in our day to day, trying to build more resilience so that we can always be adapting, always be bouncing yeah. back. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, I think what we found when we worked with the Thunder is they know it's not realistic to expect to win. They want to win. They aim to win. But once you live with that idea that you have to accept whatever happened on the court and come back the next day, that's when you become resilient. So we spend a lot of time with the team just creating the conditions for them to feel like they can constantly come up with a solution versus find themselves paralyzed. I think that's the key. Yeah, and trying to remove that fear that if they make a bad decision, they're going to get sort of reamed out or whatever. The most important thing is you get back up and make that decision and move forward, get back up, and make that decision, move forward. And we try and support them in that as opposed to judging them or saying they did something wrong or bad. The worst thing to do is to do nothing. Right. The best thing to do is to actually try and lean into the problem. And it goes back full circle to what we were saying earlier about facing what's in front of you because life is not perfect and life is difficult right. and running a business is not perfect and running a business is difficult, right? And we all know these things it's, and it is hard. But if we can embrace those things and feel as though we have a team around you and the support from the top that allows me to embrace these things and helps me and supports me, then we can tackle those things together. And that's exactly what the OKC did as a team. I had to turn off my notifications, but uh, I'm getting <laughs> hounded. Can, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's difficult to run a business, right? But, you know, and that's, that's I think, what Catherine and I have tried to create for the guys, not to shy away from stuff, but face it. And that's great. Right. And that's good. And that's what an entrepreneur does on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and I think that's you have to, have to do because there's lots of bumps in the road. And there always will be, you know, and, and, and accepting it and accepting it. So I'll ask this question as, as we close. We talk a lot about collaboration and, and this conversation in itself just is a reflection of the dynamism of your tandem, of the way that you all work together. And you were fortunate to find each other to kind of put together Clark McDowell. What advice do you have for other business leaders or prospective creative business leaders about finding a good partner? I would say think less about, you know, it's a, there's all this like technicality about where they've been, what clients they have, what money they have. Look for the spark. Look mm. for the person that when you get in the room with them, you come out with a better idea than you had before. If you don't have that, it's the wrong partner at the end of the day. Because if you make a pragmatic decision, you may, it may look good on paper, but it's a marriage. Paul and I have been running our business for 22 years. So there's days where, yeah. I put my headphones on <laughs> and get away from Paul's voice. The, 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 the Paul, Paul cancelling headphones. headphones yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if you have that spark, it drives you back to that every time. And you're like, I know why I'm in this relationship. So yeah, yeah, ultimately, yeah. if you're going to put yourself in a partnership, make sure that it's a genuine thing. You want to be with that person and they, they help you think better when you're with them. Yeah, I think that's great. Totally. I should have said, no, I disagree. No, I think that's great, totally. And it's, I think, so I didn't get into business with Catherine to go out to make money. To make money is a thing that is great and because we all need to eat and live. I went to business with Catherine to affect brands, to change the industry, to make a mm. difference, to feel fulfilled, to be excited about having conversations and making stuff. That's right. why I do what I do. And money is a consequence of that. 
I think for me personally, if my motivation was just to make money and I'm trying to kind of plug and play a business partner into that, that's a very difficult thing because you're not necessarily have the same intent and goals. The money stuff and all that, yeah, you need to align on, on values and, you know, it's somebody conservative or somebody cavalier with the cash or whatever. That's kind of functional stuff they right. can figure out. But unless you have that that North Star, that end game, that purpose and like that why and you act on it and also you have similar values around respect and around the caring about the planet and around caring for the team and wanting to be original, blah, 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 all of those things that we have, it's very difficult to do that. So without those things, you're kind of pulling in separate ways in, in lots of ways because you can get through an argument, you can get through all that crap, and it just happens. That's relationships, right? You can get through that. The other stuff you can't make up. Right. <laughs> that, you know, It's not a science. That's about serendipity and two certain people coming together at the right time with the right attitude and make something better than themselves as individuals. And I think that's what Clark McDowell is. It's not Catherine and Paul's show. It's Clark McDowell that we right. happen to have created, but it's better than the both of us. And I think that's a wonderful way to end our conversation today. One is a creative force. The other sets the vision. I'll let you decide who is who, but together they are better as Clark McDowell. I appreciate you both and sharing the wonderful view and insights on innovation, entrepreneurship, the power of brands to transform, relive, and launch, and also getting us ready for the future. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Paul. This has been incredible spending time with you both. And thank you all for joining us for Design Adjacent. Total pleasure. Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Benny. That was amazing. Thank you all. Show notes for this episode will be available on AIGA.org. Please subscribe to our show on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. AIGA's Design Adjacent Podcasts and its contents are the copyright of AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. All rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the content in any form is prohibited without AIGA's express written permission. My name is Li Shan Huang. Until next time.